We've talked to you about C-51, one of the Kill Bills. There is no longer an internal constraint left to halt the complete totalitarianism of Canada. Electoral politics, a sham. Media, subservient to corporate power. The working class is being disempowered and impoverished. The legal system, <laughs> subsidiary of the corporate state. There are no good rules here. So any form of dissent, no matter how tepid, will soon be blocked by an internal security apparatus empowered by the anti-terrorist laws that will outstrip anything dreamed of by the East German Stasi state. No one in Ottawa or Washington intends to help us. Opposing parties such as Democratic Party, may cry foul when out of power, but once in power, they bow to the demands of this omnipotent military. That's why the gods, goddesses, are always military leaders. And if you go back to what we did on Tuesday, I show you how they are always slavers and use us as commodities. They are security organs that serve the corporate masters. So any state that has the ability to inflict full-spectrum dominance on its citizens is not a free state. You do not live in a free state unless, of course, you are the Vikings who escaped what was happening in Europe and went to a little island on their own. So it does not matter if it does not use this capacity in front of your face at this moment today. It will use it. History has shown this should it feel threatened or seek greater control. And the goal of the whole sales surveillance is not in the end to discover crimes, but to be on hand when the government decides to arrest a certain category of the population. No one who lives under constant surveillance, who is subject to detention anywhere, at any time, whose conversations and messages and meetings and proclivities and habits are recorded, stored, analyzed, as ours are, can be described as free. The relationship between those who are constantly watched and tracked and those who watch and track them is the relationship between master and slave. We fight the same things as our ancestors fought. There will be no checks left on state power. State security operates outside of the law. Citizens will be convicted on secret evidence in secret courts. Citizens will be subject to arbitrary searches and arrests. Due process? That's over. It is. It's over. Internal security organs serve as judge, jury, executioner, like the one God system has always done. The outward forms of democratic participation, voting, um, competing political parties, judicial oversight, legislation, are going nowhere. They will remain. But they have become a meaningless form of political theater. It is entertainment. That is all. And once the security services become this omnipotent being, those who challenge the abuses of power, those who expose crimes carried out by the government, are treated as criminals. Totarian states always invert the moral order, the evil rule, the righteous are condemned. 
societies in some places had democratic traditions or at least periods when openness was possible on a brief level. They are often seduced into these kind of systems because the rules continue to pay outward fealty to ideas, ideals, practices, forms of these old systems that I've been telling you about. This was true when Emperor Augustus dismantled the Roman Republic. This was true when Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized control of the Soviets, ruthlessly centralized power. This was true following the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the rise of fascism in Germany. This is true today in Canada and the United States. Government is a fungus growing out of corrupt and decayed civil society. Trying to defend the treaty rights of First Nations people? You will go to prison. Try to halt the tar sands, the fracking, the bitumen carrying pipelines? You will go to prison. Try to oppose Israel's illegal occupation of Palestine? You will go to prison. And once you are seized by the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, you will be subject to sleep deprivation, sensory deprivation, the disorienting poles of extreme light and darkness, extreme heat, extreme cold, along with stress position tortures, waterboarding, beatings, pressure point tortures. This is now legal. Those singled out as internal enemies will include people of color, immigrants, gays, intellectuals, activists, feminists, Jews, Muslims, journalists, union leaders, those defined as liberal. You will be condemned by reactionary forces, fed and sustained by corporate propaganda and money, blamed for our decline. The looming economic environmental collapse, looming if you haven't noticed, it's on now. You will be pinned by these demagogues, by these hate mongers, some of whom have found perch within the CBC. You've become a scapegoat. The vulnerable are the scapegoats. The ones fleeing wars for their resources are looked at as the bad guys. The random acts of violence, such as the attack on a lone gunman on Parliament Hill, will be justified. Even harsher measures of internal control will happen. And if it doesn't happen, Fast enough, you will see more false flags. Fear will be relentlessly orchestrated to manufacture paralysis and your consent. So how do we resist? How if this thing is inevitable, as I believe it is? How do we fight back? Why should we resist? Why not give in to cynicism and despair? Why not carve out a comfortable niche, at least one as comfortable as possible, within the embrace of the corporate state and spend our lives attempting to satiate our private needs? Power elite, including most of those who graduate from our top universities, academics, politicians, the press, and our liberal and intellectual classes, the stars that you see on television, have sold out for personal comfort. So why not us? Too many of us are separated from 
each other that the lives we are living are meaningless and we cannot influence fate we will all die our individual beings will be obliterated and yet one of the only coherent philosophical positions is revolt it is the constant confrontation between human beings and our obscurity it is not an aspiration for it is devoid of hope that revolt is a certainty of a crushing fate without resignation that ought to accompany it a living person can be enslaved and reduced to the historic condition of an object if he or she dies in refusing to be enslaved he or she affirms the existence of another kind of human nature which refuses to be classified as an object the rebel stands with the opposed the unemployed the underemployed the workers the peoples of the first nations whose lands and lives are being exploited palestinians in gaza civilians in iraq and iran in afghanistan in libya the disappeared who are held in our global block sites the poor in our inner cities the depressed rural communities the immigrants those locked away in our prison system making money for this beast and to stand with them means refusal to collaborate with political systems that mouth words of justice while carrying out acts of oppression it means open and direct defiance the elites their liberal apologists dismiss the rebel we are impractical they brand the rebels outer stance as kind of productive they condemn the rebel for being inflexible unwilling to compromise these elite call for calm patience tolerance they use language of spirituality compromise tolerance generosity compassion to argue that the only alternative is to accept and to work with systems of this despotic power we rebels however are not beholden to a moral commitment that makes this impossible we rebels refuse to be bought off with the government and foundation grants invitations to parliament television appearances book contracts academic appointments empty rhetoric we rebels are not concerned with self promotion public opinion we rebels know as augustine wrote hope has two beautiful daughters anger and courage anger at the way things are courage to see that they do not remain the way they are we rebels are aware that virtue is not rewarded the act of rebellion defines its own virtue you do not become a dissident just because you decide one day to take up this most unusual career you are thrown into it by your personal sense of responsibility combined with a complex set of external circumstances you are cast out of the existing structure and placed in a position of conflict with them it begins as an attempt to do your work well ends with being branded the enemy of society the dissident does not operate in the realm of genuine power at all 
we are not seeking power. We have no desire for office. We do not want to gather votes. We do not attempt to charm you. We offer nothing, promise nothing. All I can offer, if anything, all we can offer is his or her own skin. The dissonant offers it solely because the dissonant has no other way of affirming the truth which we stand for. Our actions simply articulate his or her dignity. As a human being, regardless of the cost, we have the capacity to say no, to refuse to cooperate. Any boycott or demonstration, any occupation or sit-in, any strike, any act of obstruction or sabotage, any refusal to pay taxes, any fast, any popular movement, and an act of civil disobedience ignites the soul of the rebel, exposes the dead hand, the hidden hand of authority. It is only this refusal to cooperate that will save us. What we speak of, what I speak of now, what we have spoke of in the last, well, forever. There was a time when that alone was enough to get you jailed. There is a time when the operation of the machines becomes so odious makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers and upon all the apparatus. And you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Rebellion in the face of tyranny is its own justification. Rebellion allows us to be free and independent human beings. Rebellion chips away, however, imperceptibly, I guess, at the edifice of the oppressor sustains the fires of empathy, solidarity, hope, and finally, believe it or not, love. And in moments of profound human despair, these flames, no matter how dim, are monumental. They keep alive the capacity to be human. And we must become so absolutely free that existence is an act of rebellion. Once we obtain that freedom, we will discover the rebellion is not defined by what it achieves, but by who we become. Those who do not rebel in our age of totalitarianism, total full spectrum dominance capitalism those who convince themselves that there is no alternative to collaboration with a corporate tyranny are complicit in their own enslavement they commit spiritual and moral suicide they extinguish hope they become the living dead no one on this planet shall have the rise the most sophisticated security, surveillance state in human history. The corporate coup, it's over, and they have won. Now it is up to us. We are the people we've been waiting for. I don't know if we can build a better society on this planet. 
I don't know if it's too late. I don't even know if we will survive as a species. But I know these corporate forces have us by the throat right now. They have our children by the throat right now. I don't fight fascists because I will win. I fight them because they are fascists. And in this fight, in the face of overwhelming forces against us, it requires us to find in all acts of sustained rebellion the embers of life and intrinsic meaning that lies outside of even success requires us at once to grasp reality, to refuse to allow this reality to paralyze us. It is, and I say this to all the people, creeds or no creeds, to make an absurd leap of faith, to believe that despite all the evidence around us, that good always draws it to the good that the fight for life always goes somewhere I don't know where Buddhists may call it karma and in these sustained acts of resistance we make it possible to reclaim a future for generations that will come after us a future that the corporate state if not overthrown is over is over we continue to fight the ways that they want us to it's done you know after years of non-stop researching along with experience of course and a lifetime of involvement my mind and body and soul is riddled with symbols, names, stories from our planet and distant planets, extraterrestrial images, unsacred geometry, crystal diagrams, holy languages, strange inscriptions, and everything else that is related to deeply and persistently discovering what the hell is going on in this reality. Every day I watch others begin their quests or remain on a particular phase that simply marks yet another level of the same construct. The whole purpose of what I do and the mission we've been given was to shorten this lengthy, exhausting, sometimes unrewarding process. And there have been many casualties on the way. As some has grasped a little of the truth and been completely blown away to the degree that their former state may have been better than the latter. Some have sacrificed relationships, reputation, lifestyle, many more things of great importance just to be here, just to keep going. And those of us who are sincere are determined to make sure that it was not all in vain. What has been discovered is we as a species fast and great have faced many stumbling blocks. We have been brave which accompanies at times foolishness in opening up chasms that were stamped with fair warning. We have welcomed other beings into our deep sanctum or holy of holies with hopes that what they would gain from their interaction with us would increase them from their current state and thus make our entire reality a better place. Unfortunately, in many cases, that is not what happened. 
and now what was the most sacred has been profaned. And I speak not of physical churches or places of worship, but your own precious temple. I want you to remember a certain part in many of the childhood stories we are told. It was about special power that should never fall into the hands of evil as we know it. In the event that this would ever take place, it would mean disaster at catastrophic proportions until it was undone. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, and respected elders, that this has in fact happened, and that the most powerful weapon you have is you. We have welcomed foreign beings into our lands, and they have betrayed us. But they have taught us a most valuable lesson that shouldn't be repeated anymore. This is the stage that we correct the atrocities and those perpetrating it. To do such things, one must know how it took place. I do my best to show you on all levels how to get your mind and your body and your soul in complete order. The first entry that was made into us is actually communication, celestial light emissions, frequencies, direct audible communications, all surface straight lines, seeking to pierce our sphere. In short, everything seeks to gain our attention even if it does not deserve it the elves the fairies that's why it's a wave an elf wave it is low they want your kids they make circles which we like and invite us in this is why highest states of meditation can only be achieved when one stills or steals their mind back from whatever thought is trying to take it captive, the sound that more and more of us are hearing. So let us keep in mind that we are composite beings. We are Tiamat's monsters. <laughs> and this means we are made up of several elements. This roughly includes flesh, which has many animal and plant genes that make up its nature, viruses, other things, hive mind, which is a collection of all the knowledge and experience gained by us, and others over uncountable lifetimes, our soul, which gives us our uniqueness and is wholly comprised of not only our personal soul, but interactions, residue, collected from other souls and other spirits that we have encountered. Know now that there are many beings out in the void that are envious of your state, watching with jealous eyes, and wish to make you feel ungrateful, because misery loves company. Misery is contagious, and despair is infectious. And in several instances, these beings forfeited the chance you have been given right now by constantly making bad decisions as if they would have no effect. You've seen those types before. So imagine if every receptor is constantly being filled with something poking at us disturbingly so much that we have grown to accept it and just live with this. I call this the spear ritual. And I speak on all levels here. Imagine that these intrusions long ago removed us from a certain state. 
that we find the greatest difficulty in recalling because we were so young. This, in fact, has happened. To lend a little bit more credit to this, I refer to, I will refer to this as magic. It is known that the whole art of voodoo doll is to mimic what these deluded dark sorcerers do in an attempt to steal someone's spirit. They poke you with knives and forks and needles. Other stuff. This is why the devil is seen with a pitchfork. We are encouraged to use it for our food. To put that in our mouths. It is known that the allegory given in the Bible about piercing the side of, side of Jesus is an act of the spear ritual itself. Remember, you are the Christ. Christ is the Kudalini. I pictures. <laughs> what is basically known about this art is when a person is in a weak stage of fleshly life, Holes can be poked to remove your soul from your body, allowing a portion of your spirit to travel into the object that they are being poked with. Now comes the conclusion of the mystery of the sphere of Longinus, which was used to poke the side of the Merovingian king while on the cross. Thus, Hitler sought to sequester the sphere in order to gain the power of the Merovingian kings so his faction could be the new rulers of the world which still worships the same images as they were encouraged not to by the same book that brings forth those images. Yes, they are worshipping under an image of a sword, which is an upside-down cross. Martians, they are. Wolves, since he clothing coming from Mars, the wolf planet, Lobo, red as blood, warlike as the Romans concur. Their founders were Romulus and Remus, suckled by a she-wolf. This is somewhat of a sidebar, no pun intended. But there are many things that the untrained do not know about this reality and it is safe to say that we are in a frickin' weird place right now. Strange rules, strange costumes and customs that many of us are not familiar with because we are not high druid priests full of strange customs now wearing the costumes now inherited often that is to our own demise and their little buffer for ignorance these days so when you think of shedding knowledge because it does not make sense do reflect on how much you really know to begin with these are adepts in the Merovingian mythos they know Saturn was the old king on the Merovingian bloodline and those in possession of the stone of destiny or at least the essence of it have the right to rule under the covenant that was made long ago when the earth was conned like Genghis out of the treasures by beings that used cunning and for those wondering why I'm insisting a figurehead such as Jesus existed but more under the title of Apollyon know that his family line are those who lie and war amongst themselves for position often taking others names and the names of other beings that they have conquered again I have pictures it matters not to them if you understand this or not you are not even supposed to know about it the fact is as you see in the Bible 
they are pushing only one bloodline, insisting that everyone that came from this recessive bloodline, which is false, no bloodline that behaves as such could exist to survive as long as the true human race acting as such. It may be true, however, that over many over time, many ended up breeding with this bloodline by force as they raped all the women they came into contact with and killed the men and the young children, especially the firstborn. No matter how people want to look at their precious saints. Jesus is reported in the Bible as coming from the line of Solomon and David, which ultimately leads back to the marked, the Cain. All descendants of Cain were given the mark, so Jesus was already marked by the beast, the virgin, and it's important for us to get acclimatized and ready for an in-depth and personal conversation with yourself. Remember, unless you are listening to this with someone else there, there is nothing to be shy about, however. What must be discussed is the highest nature. This is communion. This is communication, which is intercourse. Enter course. This may be a little rough according to those terms. There are certain states that we have all been in, and one state is being a virgin. Some are unclear about why they were so fearless as a child, but now I'm certain that fearlessness had as its root our virginity. When free from external influence, one is truly who they are. They have no phobias, no fears, no programming, and it's most importantly, no intrusion. We cracked this code a while back. Similarities between the word human and the word hymen. Since they are, at least, Adam etymologically speaking the same word I came to the conclusion that humans were given that name by an intrusive species who saw them as being very fresh and newbie to the whole game of life and lies they like to play I speak of the false light the AI a royal city founded by Abraham by the way who people still think is their father there's a reason why that city became ruined and now they are trying to do it to the whole planet they are known as artificial intelligent AI not because they are real but because of their knowledge is fake hold that thought I'll be right back.